have in the, uh, the Q&A um, tab at the bottom ribbon. Um, that will uh, will answer at the end of today's session. It's my privilege today to introduce Monica Paravadino, her current role as Senior Manager for Semantics uh, on Novel. She leads the knowledge representation for knowledge for novel defining semantic and smart content strategies that enable a variety of search tools and decision support solutions like Novel Corrosion to help engineers solve complex problems efficiently. Monica has a Master of Science in Chemistry and a PhD in Chemical Sciences, Technologies and Processes from the University of Genoa. Without any further ado, I'd like to, uh, to hand this presentation over to Monica. And thank you for taking today's poll. Thank you, Mark, for your kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Monica Paravidino and today I will be talking to you, as Mark said, about uh, knowledge organization systems and in particular uh, about taxonomies. So I will be reviewing some of the most important forms of uh, knowledge organizations and I will try to highlight their benefit and why they are important uh, um, more than ever nowadays. So let me start with a bit of history, because I believe that for most of us, the first encounter with the word the taxonomy um, was in high school and probably in the context of the science classes. We then learned that the word taxonomy, uh, that, that the tendency of human beings to um, classify things uh, exists since the beginning of time, but it's not until the 18th century, and in particular to the work of Carl Linnaeus, that this tendency becomes a scientific discipline formally defined. Taxonomy was defined as the branch of biology that groups organisms according to their shared characteristics and the evolutionary history. Fast forward to the present day, uh, the word the taxonomy has kept its original meaning on one hand, so it still represents a hierarchical classification system, not necessarily applied to science, uh, but to any field, to any domain. But on the other hand, it has also taken another meaning, a broader one. It can in fact now represent uh, any means of organizing concepts of knowledge for the purposes of uh, capture, uh, management, and presentation. So in other words, uh, taxonomy is now used uh, interchangeably as a, a knowledge organization system. And uh, in uh, this particular aspect, it has receiving a lot of attention as one of the most powerful allies in the uh, information management challenge. So um, before I talk about taxonomies and the other knowledge organizations, I first want to talk about the knowledge organization in particular and about why it is so important to have a very well organized uh, knowledge base. This has to do with the fact that the recent advances in technology have literally made the information explode. We are all surrounded by data and we all experience the difficulty in finding the data we really need when we need them. And this is especially uh, a problem for knowledge workers whose uh, um, uh, daily life uh, uh, revolves around finding information. Um, here I'm giving you some examples. Uh, it's estimated that unstructured data alone doubles every three months. And the percentage that knowledge workers spend in searching for information is between 15 and 35. Also another datum which is pretty worrying is that uh, uh, for most web searches, in half percent, in, in, in half the time they fail in uh, uh, getting the users where they want to be, and therefore they are abandoned. So uh, this poor findability, uh, this difficulty in accessing data uh, has a cost. 
a cost that often gets unnoticed, but not because it's negligible. It is rather because it's difficult to estimate. There are more and more studies, fortunately, which try to uh, estimate the cost of not finding data. And here I'm referring to a paper in particular from the search and text analytics expert, Susan Feldman, who tried to uh, estimate these costs for a fictional enterprise, an enterprise of a thousand knowledge workers hired under very specific conditions. Uh, I'm not going into the details of the model, you can find it in the paper, but I'm jumping to the conclusion to highlight some figures. For this fictional enterprise, the time spent looking for and not finding information costs a total of 6 million a year. When information cannot be found, it has, of course, to be reworked. And this costs an additional 12 million a year. Uh, not locating and uh, retrieving information on top of that has an opportunity cost of more than 15 million a year. So as you can see, um, these are really costs that need to be addressed. And this is where knowledge organization systems come into the picture. How can they help? Well, first of all, by definition, they give structure to unstructured information. They organize the concept of knowledge, they create links between them, and therefore they make them discoverable. Uh, they can join multiple diverse sources of information. Um, it's very typical uh, at present to have a knowledge base consisting of uh, uh, not only a variety of uh, documents, but also a variety of document formats. Um, you may have, for, for example, databases and Word file and HTML files and videos. And all these different sources have to be uh, harmonized and organized uh, in a smart way. Knowledge organization systems also provide multiple avenues to find the relevant information. So they multiply the chances to get into data. And in doing so, they can help uh, on one end, both the experienced searchers, uh, those who know exactly what type they answer the, they want, but also those, uh, for example, who are not very familiar with the topic. So they're not sure what they're looking for. They are browsing around looking for uh, some information to start with. Um, either way, uh, knowledge organization systems can really make uh, information discoverable. Um, knowledge organization systems can come in every uh, shape and form. Um, you can see here a representation of them by their structure. So the number of dimensions they can take and by function. Uh, so by need they address and therefore by feature. The differences can be sometimes very clear to appreciate and sometimes very subtle. Um, I will not cover all of these organizations. I will just pick the most representative ones um, along the spectrum. And I will start, of course, with the simplest of all, which is the controlled vocabulary. Um, we are all familiar with controlled vocabularies, uh, uh, even without realizing it. Uh, think, for example, of the um, list of categories in Amazon or uh, the list of genre in uh, Netflix. Uh, these are all example of, uh, examples of controlled vocabularies. At a minimum, a controlled vocabulary is a restricted and uh, flat uh, list of terms uh, that are used for indexing or tagging content to support the retrieval. The content is in the fact that only terms from the list can be used for tagging, but it's also in this set of policies that accompany a vocabulary and that establish who can add the new terms if we have an editorial board, for example, and how new terms can be added. Frequently controlled vocabularies establish equivalencies between terms. So they gather all the different ways to refer to um, a concept and they uh, indicate the correct and preferred way to refer to it, defining everything else as a synonyms. When they only contain named entities, then they take sometimes the name of authority files. 
for example, a list of organization or a list of customer could be considered an authority file. Controlled vocabularies are simple, but powerful. Uh, they are very handy, for example, when dealing with uh, homographs, that is with terms that can take a different meaning depending on the context. Like for example, the word Saturn, which can refer to a planet or a rocket family or to a Roman god. Um, with a controlled vocabulary, we can make sure that uh, a corpus containing um, all these uh, homographs uh, will be tagged with the uh, correct context. And therefore we will prevent, for example, the frustration of users interested in the, the planet and only retrieving content uh, about the uh, NASA launch vehicle. Another benefit of controlled vocabulary is uh, linked to the equivalence I was uh, um, talking about earlier. So to the fact that they gather synonyms for a given concept. And here you can see another example. Let's imagine that we have a piece of text about the pharmaceutical industry, which contains these keywords on the right hand side. And now let's imagine that we have users interested in this in type of information, uh, but not using any of the uh, keywords present in the text. Uh, our user prefer to use a drug industry or big pharma in the search box. So without controlled vocabulary and simply relying on string matching, we are not able to present a very relevant piece of content to the user because there is a complete mismatch between the two sets of keywords. But if we introduce a controlled vocabulary in the middle and we use it for tag it, uh, then we can uh, make sure that regardless of the way the users look for this piece of content, they will find it. Um, I'm now going to move to uh, taxonomies, finally, uh, which are the next uh, uh, type of knowledge organization system that we can consider in terms of complexity. Because as we already saw in the beginning, uh, taxonomy establish the hierarchical relationship. So they create parent-child relationships and create a tree. Uh, they often keep, of course, also the equivalence of uh, controlled vocabularies. Um, taxonomies uh, have really an emphasis on the overarching structure. So uh, they tend to represent a domain in a way that is as comprehensive as possible. For this reason, uh, they are normally very well balanced in depth and in breadth across the branches. And they are also naturally suited to be presented and browsed hierarchically. Presenting the hierarchy itself uh, convey context and meaning that is useful to the users. And uh, here you can see an example of the uh, of one of novel taxonomies at play. Uh, this is in particular the properties taxonomy, uh, which groups all the different types of properties of chemical compounds and uh, materials. And uh, you can see here how the taxonomy can help uh, uh, looking for information in both uh, the search mode and the browse mode. On the left hand side, for example, uh, you can see what happens when a user enter in the search box, one of the synonyms we have for a particular property, the Young's modulus in this case. The equivalence of the, of the taxonomy makes sure that we are able to present to the user the type of data they're looking for, even if they refer to it by a name which we consider a synonym and not the preferred way. On the right hand side, you see a different situation. Um, here, the, um, there is no search for a particular property, but rather a user expanding a branch and looking around to see what type of properties are available for a given material. Uh, in this case, uh, the Young's modulus can be found uh, under the elastic properties, which in turn are under the mechanical properties. So again, the same type of data can be presented, but in a different in use case, so in response to uh, a different need. 
The next type of uh, uh, knowledge organization that we encounter uh, when we add another dimension is the thesaurus. Uh, thesaurus keep the equivalence of controlled vocabularies and the hierarchy uh, of taxonomies, but with a difference. I will come to that in a minute. And add another type of relationship, uh, the association between concepts. In other words, the thesauri take two concepts, A and B, and establish that they are related. We don't know how they are related and why. We only know that they have to do with each other, so they are likely to appear together in a corpus. And this information can, of course, be important, for example, for a, a recommendation engine and to find suggestion based on a previous search. I said that there is a difference in the hierarchy of thesauri compared to taxonomies. Um, in fact, uh, while taxonomies uh, tend to be comprehensive and to stress the overarching structure, thesauri, on the other hand, prefer to focus normally on the individuals. Um, they want to provide context, uh, meaning uh, of the single concept. Uh, therefore, there, it, it can happen that thesauri can be very well, mm, very well developed in one branch and relatively shallow in another. And for this reason, um, they are normally not offered hierarchically, uh, but in another form, for example, alphabetically. A simple example of thesauri uh, is this one. Uh, where we can see the information about the concept stars. We can see the hierarchical relationships with the children in this case. We can see that stars have to do with astronomy or to black holes, etc. And we are also given some guidance about uh, how the concept should be used in tagging, for example. If we want to add, to add any semantic meaning to the relationships uh, between two concepts, then what we need to do is to build an ontology. An ontology is a complex thesaurus type of knowledge organization where terms have specified attributes and relationships. So ontologies represent a domain by defining classes and by defining relationships between the classes. Um, so the result is not a table, of course, but it's a graph. It's a network of nodes, which are the classes, and links that are the relationships between the classes. Any type of relationship can be defined in an ontology depending on the domain. So the customization is possible. And this makes, of course, ontologies very powerful and sophisticated, but also um, very um, complex to handle. Coming back to the stars example, uh, in an ontology, we could think of modeling this way. We could introduce the relationship are part of to connect the stars and star clusters. And we could say that stars are the subject matter of astronomy, etc. Another example, which is taken from the engineering world, and in particular from Novel, where we are building an engineering ontology, is this one. This Ontology models the um, relationships that materials, that the class of materials has with other classes. In this case, the properties, the conditions, and the units. So what does it tell us? It tells us that materials have properties, and properties in turn depend on given conditions. And properties can be measured in units. Uh, which belong to um, unit systems, like the US customary or the SI metric. And units also, of course, are represented by an abbreviation. So they also have an as a symbol type of relationship. A term that is often used in combination with ontology is knowledge graph. There is a difference though. A knowledge graph is what we obtain when we add to an ontology um, actual instances. So for example, taken, given this ontology, we could think of picking what particular material and then adding its uh, numeric data. In this case, I'm taking a type of steel, ASI 
316. And I am representing um, the fact that he has a Young's modulus, which can be measured uh, under a set of conditions, for example, at a given temperature. And uh, um, I can also represent the type of units that are normally associated to uh, represent the Young modulus. The knowledge graph also contains information about how to convert uh, one unit to the other. So um, we saw a few examples uh, of the applications of uh, uh, knowledge organization systems. We saw, for example, that they can be used, uh, uh, they can be browsed, and they can be uh, drilled down. Um, here you can see some other uh, example of their applications and of their benefits. Uh, they enable users to filter search results. They can be used as facets, for example, as a set of keywords to narrow down a large set of results that is returned after a search. Because of the relationships that they establish between concepts, they promote the discovery of related content and concept. So they can be used, for example, to power recommendation engine, but also to power personalization of data. Ultimately, they connect the users with the answer, uh, with the answer they are looking for. And uh, they can reduce uh, uh, costs for workers and for their enterprise in at least uh, two ways. Um, first of all, by making all the information available and discoverable, they avoid the reworking of information. So they enable reuse of knowledge. And also, on the other hand, by connecting the users with the answers they are looking for, um, they enable finding data with fewer clicks. So they also um, guarantee a time saving. So coming to the conclusions of today's webinar, um, I hope I showed you the importance of having a well-organized knowledge base because when information cannot be found, it's like it never existed. So it has to be reworked. And this of course costs time and resources. And knowledge organization systems are a powerful tool in this context because they are the natural bridge between content and users. So they really can make uh, uh, information discoverable. For this reason and for their impact on costs, uh, they should be regarded as a, a business asset. They truly are. And finally, uh, we saw that there are many types of knowledge organization systems. We actually saw just a few of them, but uh, one point I would like to stress is that really the uh, best knowledge organization system that you can select, that you can design, is the one that has the best adherence with the type of content and the type of use case. So uh, take into account correctly both the use case one is trying to address and the type of corpus they are dealing with is key in designing the uh, most effective knowledge organization system. Uh, before closing, I would like to leave you with uh, some reference, uh, a couple of Bibles on uh, the topic of uh, taxonomies and knowledge organizations, and also a few online resources about standards uh, that are used for uh, building knowledge organization systems. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude. I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll hand it over to you, Mark. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I want to launch a, uh, a secondary um, post session poll, if you'd be so kind to, uh, to answer it. Um, and while people are answering the, uh, the poll questions, we've got a couple of questions for you, Monica, if you'd be so kind. Um, someone wrote, when calculating the costs of not finding information, how can we account for serendipity uh, or finding info one wants when the person finds the information by accident? I'm afraid we cannot. 
<laughs> this is one of the problems uh, that take yeah that that we have to consider and that also makes it so difficult to evaluate uh, uh, to evaluate the cost so i believe it was not accounted for in the paper i refer to probably there can be um, other studies that try but i'm inclined to think that it's quite difficult thank you um, another question is, what are the most important steps in designing and building a knowledge organization? Yes, um, well, the first one is literally, as I was saying earlier, is, the, uh, is a good knowledge of the corpus and also a very good understanding of uh, the uh, use case. So it's easy to say we need a taxonomy, we need something to organize our knowledge, uh, but then this has to be broken down. So who, mm, there are questions that have to be answered in terms of who's gonna use the taxonomy, uh, how they are going to use it, and uh, what exactly are we trying to achieve? When this is clear, uh, then the uh, next step is to, uh, audit the content and also understand the overall um, publishing process. So how does new content come in? How does the tagging proceed? Where is our taxonomy going to exist? And having then um, collected all the information, the actual, um, uh, the, the, the actual building can start. And uh, the, the, the next steps are all about then the, um, the governance and the future plans. So uh, a taxonomy is never finished. So it's very important also to think how a taxonomy or knowledge organization can grow organically. How can the new concepts be added in a structured and harmonized way? And, uh, um, and these are, the, in a nutshell, the most important uh, steps. Okay. Uh, following up on that, what kind of possibilities do ontologies and knowledge graphs open up compared to simple taxonomies? Yes, well, um, the possibilities they open up are really linked to the fact that they can establish as many relationships as you want and the type of relationships that we want. So, um, um, and also because they are based on triples so they are based on one of the uh, standard and on the foundation of the semantic web uh, they can enable for example answering complex questions from user um, for example the ability of uh, uh, answering questions that are written in natural language um, instead of providing just the numeric data uh, we can we become really able to, um, to reply to users, for example, uh, asking for uh, how do I remediate uh, uh, this corrosion problem? So this is the type of advantage they offer. Great. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's session. Uh, the link uh, will be available uh, probably next week, beginning of next week, uh, a recording of today's session, and it will be joining the over 40 webinar recordings that we've done to date. We want to thank those who have joined today, but also the series throughout. Um, our series for 2021 is concluding today, and we'll be coming up with a, a new a series for 2022. If you have ideas or would like to be part of a presentation, please reach out to your customer consultant or myself. I had listed my, uh, my email address in the chat and uh, we'd love to hear from you so that we're hitting the topics and information that's most important for you. But thank you so much for your time and for your attention today. And uh, most importantly, thank you, Monica, for covering this topic for us and our audience. Uh, have a great day, everyone, and happy holidays.